So if you've got a Bible, I would invite you to feel free. There's some under the pews. If you don't have one, there's some on the, the Welcome Center that you're welcome to keep and take those blue Bibles. They're yours for the keeping. If you don't own a Bible, uh, pull out your iPhones, your iPads, your Androids. If it's got the Bible, it's the Bible. I don't care where it is. Feel free to grab one. We will be in First Samuel, um, First Samuel 1 and 2 primarily today, starting in First Samuel 1.10. And uh, we are going to be looking, as I said, at Hannah. And, and I would title this story, basically, as it says on the screen. Her story is, is from barren to blessed. And, and I'll hopefully be able to work that in along the way here for you. And as we read through the early part of the Old Testament... If you're familiar with that part of the Bible, you know that there are a number of different prominent women there who had a problem with barrenness. They were unable, at least for a period of time at least, they were unable to have children, right? And this, of course, is a rather ironic part of the story of Scripture when you consider the fact that God had promised to Abraham that his seed would, of course, multiply and be as numerous as the stars, right? Right? And then we keep running into these women that continue to have problems bearing children. I mean, Abraham, he loved his wife Sarah, right? But she was barren. She was barren before God finally, finally, finally opened her womb and blessed her with Isaac, right? Isaac's wife, Rebecca, she was barren before God opened her womb and blessed her with twins. And we know those twins, Esau and Jacob, right? Now, Jacob, of course, he loved Rachel, And he loved Rachel so much that he went to Rachel's father, Laban, and said, hey, I will work for you for seven years so I can marry your daughter. So Jacob works for seven years. He gets married, lifts the veil. You're not Rachel. What's happened? Well, old dad says, well, tradition is that the oldest daughter gets married first. If you want to marry Rachel, you've got to work seven more years. He works 14 years to marry Rachel, right? That's how much he loved her. And even though Jacob loved her incredibly, her womb was closed. Leah, she bore Jacob's six sons and a daughter. Before, finally, God remembered Rachel and opened her womb. Samson's mother, she was barren before the Lord opened her womb as well. And blessed her with him. And that brings us then to Hannah, who was also barren at this point in her life. And before we begin looking at the story, let me address the men in the room, because we're all going, barren, barren, uh, what are you talking about, Pastor? How am I supposed to connect with this? Men, though, and everyone, being barren is not just an emotion or a physical condition that only childless women experience. We've all experienced at some degree barrenness through our faith journey. Anyone who has longed for and prayed for an an elusive blessing that seemingly will never come their way can identify with and, and, and appreciate, in fact, what it means to be barren. And then when when God finally comes through with our blessing, of course the problem is we sometimes We forget to thank him, don't we? And we forget to thank the people around us who have been praying for us. That's why I I loved your, your, your word this morning, Carol, of just saying thanks for praying for me. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you all for praying for me who pray for me. I appreciate it. I need it. And sometimes we just, we, we, we get so caught up in ourselves and our needs and our wants that we forget to just say thanks. And whether it's childlessness or joblessness or loneliness or anything else that we desperately seek, if we live long enough, we all will experience barrenness. To be barren is to be put on hold by God while everyone around you is being blessed oftentimes with the very thing that you desire, the thing that you want most, the thing that you want with all of your heart. Maybe you've come here today feeling that barrenness somewhere in your life. Maybe, maybe you're running on empty and you don't feel so good living in this chaotic world that we live in. 
See, in the story, Hannah was feeling a little low as a result of her situation. She had no children, and she desperately, desperately wanted to conceive. Hannah's example is a good one for everyone to follow, not only just would-be mothers. As we look at her story, I would encourage everyone to trust in the Lord and to wait patiently on Him until He turns your season of barrenness into blessedness. I think as you read along with me today, you'll see Hannah is a remarkable woman. See, she lived in a, in a dysfunctional family situation, but she never allowed those dark circumstances of her life to cause her to give up hope for a child. Now, as was typical in this time in, in the Israelite culture, during the time of Judges, Elkaniah, her husband, had a second wife, and her name was Penaniah. And as you might expect, this leads to there being various kinds of conflict in the household, right? The Bible says that the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. And in that day, it was considered, and and I would say wrongfully, but in that day it was considered uh, basically a disgrace for a woman not to have children. And Elkaniah recognized that that Hannah had this, this ache in her heart from this situation. And so he gave her a double portion of blessings of the sacrifice. He, he, he kind of like pushes across the table a little extra portion for her because he knows she's feeling left behind a little bit. Penaniah, on the other hand, she has no problem. She's got several sons and some daughters. And not only that, but to make matters worse, she kind of likes to provoke Hannah a little bit, right? This is the wife with all the kids, and she's like, ha, 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 right? I can't imagine a household with two wives. Oh. And then have one tormenting the other. Right? Because she hasn't had any children. And of course, Hannah reacts with bitter anguish to her barrenness and this constant teasing from her, I don't know, co-wife? What do you call that? I don't even know. And in no amount of comforting, of course, from her husband could, could really relieve her of this pain. Elkaniah would say to Hannah, Honey, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? I don't think he was a bright man, by the way. But he says, Don't you know you mean more to me than ten sons? Right? Like that's going to help, pal. There's no comfort. She wanted a child. Now, if you were Hannah, how would you feel in that situation? So what do you think she did? Well, she cried a lot. And sometimes, as it says, she did go without eating. But she never actually got mad at Penaniah. She never actually thought back. Instead, and this is where she is such a tremendous model of faith, instead of doing what most of us would do as a reaction to the situation, instead, she trusts God. Wow. Now you might be ridiculed by your your non-Christian friends, by your neighbors, by your relatives, maybe even by your husband, wife, or members of your immediate family. But when you practice in trusting the Lord with a faith that, that shows no hypocrisy, when you live in such a sincere and transparent way, the people in your life see you trusting God. The people in your life will marvel. The people in your life will, will look at you and even sometimes question, why are you trusting in God, right? It doesn't seem to make sense to this world. It's not how the world responds and reacts and behaves. When you want something, you go for it. And when you don't get it, you throw a fit. Right? Not all the time, though. One of the things we say to our son is, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. That doesn't work so well with a seven-year-old sometimes. But if you truly live in such a way that you are showing that you trust God, the world will see it and notice you are living differently. See, she trusted in God. And someday if you do the same, 
that might be the influence that somebody in your life needs to cause them to begin to see Christ themselves. You see, a long time ago, when I was a fairly new Christian, somebody gave me this little nugget of wisdom, and he said, people will know who you are by who you are when you are under pressure. Right? Who you are when you are under pressure reveals your true self. Are you a whiner? A complainer? A griper? A grouser? A quitter? Are you somebody who perseveres? Who doubles down and works all the harder? Are you somebody who who says, while the blessing has not come, I will still trust in the Lord? People may not even know that your faith is real until they see it under trial. Trust the Lord in all circumstances because you never know who is watching. Let's look at four things that Hannah did to see that her vision would become a reality. The very first thing, if you're taking notes, is Hannah prayed for God to bless her with a child. She prayed, right? 1 Samuel 1.10 says, She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. So simultaneously, praying to God and crying. She was greatly distressed, wept bitterly. She, she had a burden on her heart, and she knew that the Lord was the only one who could possibly relieve that burden for her. Whenever, whenever we have a burden, whenever we are distressed, whenever we're bitter about some situation in our lives, we, like Hannah, have to take it to the Lord. It's so easy to pick up the phone and complain to somebody else. It's so easy to turn to a spouse and, and just, right? It's easy. And sometimes we do need to do that. We need a safe place. We need somebody we can trust that we can share with. But more often than not, we go way too far. We complain to two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Anybody who will listen, we start complaining to them, right? And we don't ever pause and stop and just bring it to the Lord. Hannah gives us this wisdom. Bring it to the Lord. Even, even when the tears are flowing and you're weeping. Even in those moments of soul-crushing pain. She brings it to the Lord. See, on a, on a yearly pilgrimage to the tabernacle... Hannah silently poured out her grief to God. And and as she did so, I believe Hannah knew exactly what we need to know as we pray to God our Father. That we cannot expect a fast food answer from God. Okay? I want you to notice something about Hannah's prayer. She was persistent. 1 Samuel one twelve says this. It says that, that she, that Hannah, continued praying before the Lord. She didn't just go to the Lord once and say, God, I need your help. Here we go. Amen. No. I'm going to keep coming, God. I'm going to keep praying, God. Because, God, I know you hear me. And, God, you are the only one, only one who can solve this in my life. I've got this problem and I need you. So I am going to continue persistently in prayer. And you see, when God's people are searching or, or trying to carry out God's visions for their lives, we have to be praying persistently, and patiently waiting for God to respond, realizing that God will respond in His time, not in our time. God is not the magic genie in the sky that we rub and get answers from whenever we want. We don't get the fast food answers from God. Sometimes it takes a day, a week, a year, a decade, a lifetime. I think of all those praying grannies, right? Who've been praying for their grandkids. 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years, they might come to know the Lord. And they keep on praying faithfully. What a beautiful testimony of faith. And if that's you, keep praying. Keep praying. If God lays somebody on your heart, pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. As Hannah shows us, be persistent. Because God will answer in his time. Here's another point I want you to see about Hannah's prayer. 
She was fervent, it says. She was intense in her prayers. First Samuel one fifteen says this, I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Her prayers, in fact, when she was praying, her prayers were so intense that the old priest, his name was Eli, she's praying so intensely, this old priest sees her and he's like, this woman's drunk. Because she is so into her prayer. Hannah was following the type of prayer example set by Jeremiah that he gives as he encourages the nation of Israel. You can see it in Lamentations 2.19. He says, Arise, cry aloud in the night. At the beginning of the night watches, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to Him for the life of your little ones. You ever been there before? Have you ever poured out your soul? Have you ever poured out your heart like, like water before the presence of the Lord? Hannah did. And it wasn't because she was drunk. After convincing Eli that she was just simply, she was just praying out of deep anguish and tremendous grief. Eli then responds to her as any good priest or pastor at the time uh, should respond when they encounter somebody who's, who's just petitioning God to remove their barrenness, right? Eli responds by saying, Hannah, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you your petition that you have asked of him. When he says that, Hannah embraces Eli's response as an affirmation of her petition to God. And she gets up, she she wipes the tears from her eyes and she goes home with a new attitude. See, she was no longer downcast after this point because she knew in her heart that God was going to turn her barrenness into blessedness. And indeed, he did. Now, not only did Hannah pray, the second point, if you're taking notes, is that Hannah then promised that she would dedicate her child to God. Look at 1 Samuel 1.11. It says, she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all of the days of his life and a razor shall never come upon his head. See, if God would answer her prayer and cause her to conceive, she would give him back to the Lord. Before Samuel was even born, Hannah had dedicated him to the Lord's service. Now, many moms make various commitments to God, right? Various promises to God concerning children when they're smaller, even before they're born. But then oftentimes, we forget. They get a little bit older, we move on. We don't don't follow through with the things that we had said. But you see, Hannah kept her promise. Notice how important it was to actually dedicate the child to God. 1 Samuel 1, 24-28 says this, Now when she had weaned him, she took him with her, with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. 25. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. She said, O oh, my Lord, As your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. Verse 28, so I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. And it says he worshipped the Lord there. Now before we look at how Hannah kept her promise, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever made a promise to God? Probably all of us. I mean, if we're a Christian, we've made a big promise to God, right? We said on that day when we gave our lives to Jesus Christ that we would commit to him as our Savior, yes, and and, and, and as our Lord, right? That means that we are going to seek him and follow him and his will for our lives. So... Have you kept your promise? What have you promised to God? Maybe that you're still holding back and holding out on. That brings me to my third point about Hannah. You see, Hannah 
she prepared her children to serve God. When Samuel was small, Hannah didn't even bother to go up to the tabernacle for the yearly sacrifice. 1 Samuel 21 through 23 says, Then the man Elkaniah went up with all of his household to offer to the Lord yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkaniah, her husband, said to her, Do what you think is best. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. How did, how did Hannah prepare herself and, and her son Samuel to serve God? She trained him at home. Hannah took the responsibility of training Samuel until he was ready to be presented to the priest Eli. Now, it wasn't uncommon for Hebrew children to be nursed by their mothers for several years. Um, that, that was pretty common. And we are led to believe by the context of this passage that there were others, children about at the time this was going on, and the other wife and the other children. And, and that Samuel and his mother would stay home is a little bit different, but they did so thinking it was for the best. Because then once he is weaned, once he is old enough to be on his own, then he's going to be staying there and not coming back. It's doubtful that he would have been presented to Eli before he was able to care for himself. He would have had to be old enough to, to wash himself, to dress himself, uh, to be content away from home. We don't know the exact age when this happens, but when he was old enough, she brings him to Eli and there was no greater person available to teach Samuel the spiritual truth in that time than this great old priest. But without Hannah's training in the early years of Samuel's life, he would have never become what he did. See, studies consistently show that, that children frequently reflect their parents' level of spirituality. Not always, but frequently. Generally speaking, Insecure parents create insecure children. Non-spiritual parents will tend to create non-spiritual children. Rebellious parents create rebellious children. But we can praise God that more times than not, that God-fearing, Bible-believing, God-loving parents create God-fearing, Bible-believing, God-loving children. Christian children. So all of us need to be aware of what sort of training we provide in our homes. And it doesn't matter how old your children are. You still have spiritual influence over them. If you're 90 and they're 70, you still have influence. Now after Hannah dedicated Samuel to the temple for service, it says that each and every year she went up to see him. First Samuel two eighteen and 19 says this, it says, Now Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy wearing a linen ephod. And his mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him from year to year when she would come up with her husband to offer their yearly sacrifice. See, Hannah keeps track of his progress, right? She keeps encouraging him after he leaves home, just as we should do with our children after they leave our homes. And there is one final point to make about what Hannah did to make sure that her vision became a reality. You see, Hannah praised God for the blessing that he gave her. The Lord remembered Hannah, it says in Scripture, and opened her womb, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the very first way that she praised God was simply in the naming of her son. Remember, particularly in Old Testament times, the names that children are given are incredibly important. And verse 20 said, it came, about it came about in due time after Hannah had conceived and that she gave birth to a son that she named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. But you see, Hannah's, Hannah's blessings didn't end with the birth of Samuel. Hannah experienced what so many of us have experienced in our lives 
And it's that when God does pour out his blessing, he pours it out abundantly, right? Our God is not a God of a scarcity. Our God is a God of abundance. And Hannah had only prayed for one boy, and it says that, that God had indeed given it to her. And then in 1 Samuel 2.11 it says this, that the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. God gave her a child of incredible gifting, wonderful fruitfulness, and amazing faithfulness. Now listen what else happened to Hannah when she comes to bring her son one of these tunics that she makes for him. 1 Samuel 2, 20 through 21 says this, Then Eli would bless Elkaniah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children from this woman in place of the one she has dedicated to the Lord. And they went on their own to their home. And it says that the Lord visited Hannah and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. So now we've got four sons and two daughters in total. And the boy Samuel continued to grow before the Lord. What an amazing story, right? She just said, God, I want one. And the tidal wave of God's blessing comes upon her when it comes. And you see, this young man... Samuel, even if he was her only one, would have been an amazing one. Samuel reflects the greatness of his mother, Hannah. You see, Samuel is the one who leads Israel through its first great revival. He, he's the one who drove the Philistines back to their territory. He's the one who reestablished the worship of Jehovah. He is the one who helped set up the kingdom of Israel. He's the one who anointed King Saul, the very first king of Israel, and then went on to anoint King David, right? And many scholars believe he's the one who wrote First Samuel. 1 Samuel 2.26 says this, Now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and with men. I really like that verse, because it reminds me of another who was described in a very similar way. Any idea who that might be? It was Jesus. Thank you. It was Jesus. Luke 2.52. Although Hannah had never, of course, heard the New Testament she experienced that very promise nonetheless. Paul promises us in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him, God, who is able to do far more abundantly above all that we ask or think to ask, right? Hannah was so thrilled with her blessing that God had bestowed upon her. In fact, Hannah's prayer and praises become one of the very first psalms. You open your Bible and you read your psalms, you'll see what I'm talking about. She, she records this song of praise. We call it Hannah's song. And it says, Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you. Nor is there any rock like our God. Hannah was happy. Hannah was jubilant because of her faith. Hannah had been blessed and she had so deeply trusted in God. And then she recognized her responsibility in training up her son and now she was reaping the benefits. That difficult situation that the story started off with now had become an abundant blessing. You see, Hannah changed the course of history through her son Samuel. This godly woman prayed that her vision of a son would one day be used by God, would be used in his kingdom, that it would someday come into being a reality, that her prayer would be answered. And she kept praying. Are you praying that God's vision for you will become a reality. Hannah is a great example of this. A great example of a woman who had great faith, who prayed. She prayed for a child. She promised. She followed up with her promise and dedicated him. She prepared. She prepared him to serve. And then 
all of the rest of her days, she praised him. She praised God for all of the blessings that he had given her. So much that we could learn from that, folks. If you are walking in a season of barrenness or somebody in your life is, pray. Keep praying. Believe God will provide in his time and not yours. But when he does, it will be in abundance. And when he does, then praise him. Amen? Let's pray.